Thank you, Dr. Sean Cunningham, for uh, joining us and contributing to this special section for the Journal of Contemporary Thank European um, Research and your lecture in European politics uh, mm -hmm. in, in UCC. Um, and what the purpose of this uh, special section is, is to address the general challenge of the rise of populism, perhaps what we might call a crisis of legitimacy um, in, in democracy and how we as academics and educators working in the field of European studies uh, can address some of those challenges. So, I mean, maybe to start, why do you think that political education itself is important in the context of democracy? Right. Um, as you say, I've been a um, lecturer for 20 years now. So my experience in the last 20 years has been that students have come to the degree that we're doing in politics here in UCC, knowing less and less about politics, about even just the procedural aspects of it, like elections, voting. And the last election we had in Ireland showed that as well through the number of spoilt votes and people who didn't know how to vote even um, happened. Um, I have also noticed a huge increase in polarisation of students coming into my classes with very set ideas, very often not well developed but it's due to youth as well um, based on facts that can be highly uh, disputed or you know discussed but they're not open to that discussion and that is a, a huge problem and I think political education in that sense is hugely um, necessary to broaden their mind even if they stick to their um, views but at least it is better informed and it's grounded into facts. Um, and finally, I think uh, political, political edu education cannot just rely on facts. We have to acknowledge um, emotions, I think, uh, and this idea that you, you know, obviously with the fake news era, uh, we are all kind of targeting facts, facts, facts. Brexit has showed that, uh, you know, you've had a number of lies being said and uh, in both camps and that hasn't helped the debate. So. As lecturers, we're, we're focusing on facts, but we also, I think, have to acknowledge emotions um, and discuss that in class and give a safe space in terms of this political debate happening and uh, allow students to express their views and um, look for evidence and develop much more refined and nuanced um, opinions. Um, there's been a lot of talk recently, I guess, about the, this idea of a crisis in, in democracy and part of the things are, are what you mentioned there around the fake news, around contestation, mm. around facts, around the closing down of, of political possibilities um, and political debates. Do you think that this has reached a level where it's, it's a societal challenge or do you think that this is somewhat overblown or perhaps exaggerated? I think the crisis of democracy is slightly overblown. Well, it depends what you mean by crisis. Mm. If crisis means... Um, we're ready to overthrow, you know, or, or threaten the, the democratic system, that we're not there yet at all. Um, we're lacking an alternative. What would be the alternative, I think, is largely that. Um, so the acute crisis isn't there. The latent crisis, a lot of theorists have actually highlighted this, um, you know, had the mass um, offer, etc. Um, and this idea of a uh, hollowing out of democracy um, in, in real life, obviously populism and like um, Victor Orban's claim for illiberal uh, democracy could actually highlight how we believe less and less in the values of liberal democracy. But the, the, the polls show that people support the regime called democracy, maybe not hugely understanding what democracy means as such and what it involves in terms of representative democracy. Obviously, the trust in different institutions and um, and our representatives um, and political parties uh, has gone down uh, significantly in the last two decades. So we can see a latent crisis. Um, the populist regimes that we see or the populist support that we, we, we've seen emerging is still happening within the context of democracy. So it's still within elections. It's still, they still respect, you know, the judicial system and etc. Yes, I know Poland and Hungary are before the European Court of Justice for um, breaching uh, the, 
the merging of uh, different branches of government. I get that, but um, I still think it's still they're still operating largely within the democratic system. So um, I think it's it's up to us to lecturers and um, and uh, people who believe in liberal democracy to stand up and explain what liberal democracy does and doesn't do as well um, and um, and it, it, it's more a phase and a lull I think than a, a crisis where democracy is going to disappear. And it's interesting I'm just struck by the, the way you, you phrased the response there about how to what extent is this a new phenomenon? Because one of the things we all remember from the Cold War mm. is that to identify the authoritarian communist regimes was to look for the ones with democratic in, yes. in their titles. So yes. the, the GDP or GDR or the, the People's Republic of so, so-and-so. Um, so I, I wonder what you th- to what extent do you think there's something new going on with the way in which electoral authoritarianism um, is, is manifesting itself in the contemporary world? Um, yes, I, I, I think... If I take, I'm originally French, and if I take the example of, um, you know, the Front National and how it's been operating in France for the last 30 years, um, I I still think um, there there has been an increase in the polling uh, results in France for a strong person, man or woman, um, making decisions and taking the lead. It, It wasn't necessarily... and. It has coincided with an increase of the Front National. At the same time, the Front National had to kind of tame a certain number of themes that it had, like anti-Semitism and, you know, even on on migration had uh, to kind of tame it a little bit. But um, even uh, uh, someone like Emmanuel Macron, who cannot be taxed of authoritarianism, I think, um, is still regarded as was regarded as the savior you know i i think increasingly voters are looking for um not necessarily authoritarianism but but a, a, a savior one man or a woman that will bring all the solutions um i think that that is a a, a trend all right the 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 trend in parallel which i brings me back to my first answer i i that i can see is this idea that facts will refute and, and rationality right will refute fake news and necessarily will all come to a consensus on what the right way is and that is at the heart of technocracy and that has really damaged i think the development of the european union for example as a policy as a uh, political system and that the, the the twin track of populism and technocracy actually both negates pluralism and both negate political debate. And this is what we're missing at the moment, or we're we're losing slowly, is this ability to listen to each other and to accept that you might be of a different opinion to me, but you're not necessarily wrong. Not making a moral judgment on what you think, but a political judgment. You might have a different political view. One of the things you mentioned in, in the first answer was the experience you have of undergraduate students coming into university and having a very fixed set of ideas, yeah. perhaps, and, and not necessarily having the skills to, to open up to hearing opposing yeah. views, even if they end up defending the position um, they came yeah. in with. I know you're involved with a very innovative project in, in getting at um, young people at a much younger stage. I wonder if you can tell me a little bit more about, about that project. Yeah, so um, about two years ago, I got a grant from the European Commission um, to set up a Jean Monnet project. We set up a project called My Big Friendly Guide to the European Union. And it's about, um, I mean, largely it's about developing a program of teaching and learning about Ireland and the European Union. And it was very important for us to ground it in Ireland rather than think top down, but go bottom up. Um, So it's about Ireland and the European Union and it's at primary school level. So it starts at five years old and it goes all the way to 12 years old until sixth class, juniors to sixth class. Um, What it involves is a lot more, obviously kids have no idea about the European Union. When I go into classes, particularly in the younger classes, but even in the fifth, sixth class, they have no idea about the European Union. And then you tease it out and you you talk about the currency. So that obviously, um, you know, uh, they can identify something that they know. Um, You talk about very practical things like their reg plate. The reg plate will have 
IRL and then the uh, European flag and then you you draw the similarities with other reg plates from um, you know France and Germany and etc and they all have the little Irish flag and you, and you tr um, European flag and you try to get them to to find where the EU is in their life but very importantly I think what it has become the first year I, I piloted it for two years the first year I thought it was about teaching the children about um, Ireland's role within the European Union and what the European Union does and doesn't do. By the second year, what I realised actually it was, and it was largely through the feedback of the, the children, it was about getting them to think critically. And the children, just like the students uh, coming into first year here, are very well able, when you give them the space and the time to think, are very well able to ask really um, unsettling questions actually about the role of Ireland, a small country into a big club um, and what the European Union does and what are the advantages of being part of the club, why shouldn't we leave? Obviously Brexit was a big topic as well because they're aware of their neighbour and they have family usually living in the UK. And the Teased out so many different themes that I, I do with a different vocabulary with my own students in college. And I did that with them at a very young age. Now, you use different methods. We used um, children's literature. We used uh, hands-on activities. We used role um, playing and etc. We organised uh, European elections. But it's to get them through what we call praxis. So uh, hands-on uh, you know, uh, pedagogy to get them to to take ownership of what the EU means for them and understand what Ireland does within the EU. It's, it's really interesting what you're saying there and, and putting it in, in that different vocabulary for, mm. for quite quite young children starting as, as young as five. And I guess what, what motivated you to, to engage in, in, in teaching at that level and, and, and to I suppose to, to try and, and, and frame the European Union for, for those very young citizens. Yeah, um, that came from, again, the 20 years of experience. So I've been teaching European politics for 20 years and I get students age 18 coming in and I have them for four years. And actually for the four years, we all struggle um, to understand what the EU is beyond paying for bridges and roads in Ireland. Um, beyond that, what does it mean? What, what, what does it represent? What values does it stand for? Um, and what future can it develop and etc. So um, I, I kept asking my students, why, is it, why do you find it so abstract? Because I see the EU in everywhere in our life and they couldn't. And they kept saying to me, well, we, are students who are inherently interested in politics. We do discuss the government, the Doyle, our TD, um, you know, our lo local councillor at the dinner table. We never talk about the European Commission, our MEP, you know, what the commissioner has just announced, or etc. So we come to college and it's this abstract thing up in Brussels. So I decided that actually using a very simple vocabulary, and it is very easy to do. I could explain shared sovereignty, I could explain solidarity, I could explain the freedoms of movement, uh, the single market, the customs union, to younger children. And I needed to go very young for them to nearly feel it emotionally, what it was to be part of this club. Um, and interestingly, when I do a feedback sheet at the end, um, I ask them, do you think it's worth um, learning about the EU? And inevitably, what I get is, yes, because we're part of it, so we have to know. And this is, this is all I want. What I want them to under understand, whether they become Nigel Farage or whether they become, you know, Antonio Spinelli, they just need to understand how it works and then develop their, through that awareness and that understanding, develop their own political position on the EU then. They might become ultra-federalist. They might just think, no, Ireland should retain a huge portion of sovereignty and, um, you know, defend, not take part in uh, a, a European defence or um, et cetera, et cetera. So I, I'm not pushing, I'm not selling the EU at all. 
I'm just trying to get them to understand what the EU does and doesn't do and what Ireland does within the EU. And to recognise that they're actually a part of this. Yes, and absolutely. And they adopt their positions. It's just belonging to a country. But uh, so in a certain way, I'm trying to get them to develop a sense of multi-level citizenship. So they are not aware, even though... So I literally bring the passport. We have a game on passports. And I show them that every EU passport, the first line is European Union citizenship uh, in the national language. But, you know, and they're not aware that on their Irish passport, they have European Union citizenship. Um, So this multi-level citizenship, like they're well aware they're from a county. You know, we start town, right, county, country, but then it becomes faith, then there's the world, whatever. And I'm like, no, no, there's another level here that's really important, and you belong to this. Uh, and it gives you rights, it gives you duties, but it gives you a certain number of rights. So we tease that out, and um, and it's very interesting because they're very much, they're very, they're very interested. They ask incredibly incisive questions, and um, and I, I would my next step would be to see whether it embeds then you know yeah. i do six weeks with them in a year's time is it embedded has something kind of grown from this or yeah. even settled not even grown but settled in that has it stayed with them so that that's the next step but for now i just uh, try to um get them to think and um and analyze what it means for them that's very i'm, I'm just curious based on something you mentioned there about this idea of you say you have town, county, country, yeah. and then it's more abstract. How have you found, how, how receptive are, are the children to thinking about identity in that way, that identity isn't a zero-sum kind of thing, it's, it's something where you have a bunch of different identities that make up us, us, us as a whole. Have you found any insights from that, from, from dealing with children in, in that sense? So interestingly, um, their first reaction, and particularly when they're young, is, you know, I'm from Kilmurray, or I'm from Clonakilty, or, you know, yeah. it's very local. Um, and actually, any type of um, research that has been done in political socialization of children usually starts around 11, 12. Yeah. Uh, below is regarded as far too young. And that is something that I completely dispute. Like from my experience with the children, we can so start so much earlier. But children nowadays, maybe when I was a kid, um, you know, I was um, completely... Uh, unaware of what was happening in the world but nowadays they Mm. know a lot and they are aware of a lot and they ask a lot of questions um so it's time to actually um answer those questions get them to discuss with us and etc uh so it's the right time to engage them i think um and um yeah so i i think um in terms of their identity automatically they think local but when you get them to to uh, reflect it's again giving them the space and the time so uh, you know it's an hour um, um, long lecture or class um, sometimes I did an hour and a half with eight-year-olds and uh, it worked perfectly well uh, but you have to follow the children so then it's it's more in terms of the pedagogy you yeah. use with them so when it's more on the deliberative side they're more willing to engage with you rather than me just talking all the time, yeah. you know. So, uh, but in terms of identity, um, obviously the EU meant nothing to them when I went yeah. to meet them. When I started linking it to their life, so through the currency, through the registration plate, through, um, you know, a, a kid one Monday arrived and uh, showed me a picture he'd taken. He'd gone to the Waterford Pier and on the pier you had a series of flags and he was so proud to show me the European Union flag, which he had never noticed, but suddenly it meant something for him, you know. Um, and and then, so by the end of the six weeks, they they they... This embryo of a awareness of ide- of European identity seems to be there, right? And and they're certainly suddenly relating. Oh, I'm going on holidays to France. It uses the euro. France is part of the club, just like Ireland. 
we are all in it together. You know, we're following the same rules. And Brexit, again, has been helpful in that sense because they're asking why the UK is leaving. And I'm saying, you know, because they want to create their own rules. They're not very happy with the EU rules and etc. And And they're asking, oh, should we have our own rules too? You know, and they're yeah. thinking about... Um, should we be better off with uh, Britain because they're very close to us and should we have the same rules as the UK rather than the EU? They, they tease all this out. So um, I, I don't claim to create a European identity by the time I've done my six weeks. What I'm saying <laughs> is that it's, it raises this awareness of a multi-level citizenship or identity, if you want, um, of, of belonging not only to a community, a county, a country that they understand, but also uh, a, a bigger club. Um, the flag is uh, important, but the anthem is important as well. Like nobody knows the, an the European anthem when I come. By the time I'm done, <laughs> they can sing it by themselves. You know, the 9th of May, Europe Day, St. Patrick's Day, 17th of March. I, I make the parallel. And all that, they were unaware of it, but they're not rejecting it. They're not saying, that's not us. You know, they, they're just really, really curious and very keen about it. And this is why seeing how it embeds, I think, is really important Yeah. to see what happens from it. Yeah, just to pick, pick yeah. up on that, that question of, of embedding, it, when you go back, you know, a year or two after you've yeah. done this programme, what kind of things are you looking for to see whether this has been successful or unsuccessful? What kind of markers are you going to Okay, I think I think what I'll be looking for is literally what they remember from it. So, a, a sheet of paper. Um, we use drawings quite a bit. So whether they draw or they list, I don't. I don't really care actually. But what they remember from Ireland and the European Union. I won't say from the course because. Even if they bring in an experience that they had on holidays or a discussion that they had from home, for example, a lot of parents, we, we organised uh, graduation ceremonies for the pilot schools and we invite the parents. And a lot of parents have said to me, this is incredible. My child suddenly is asking me whether where we're going on holidays is within the EU, you know, what's the latest on Brexit and this like discussions we had we never had so um so i i will plainly ask what you know <laughs> what can you remember uh, from uh, from the experience um and i think i will ask them maybe um at this stage a year odd what does it mean for you to be part of the european union brexit will have happened probably um and uh, <laughs> yes probably and uh some european politics will have happened and um and what does it mean to be part of the european union if it stays very much on what i had said you know uh, in a very procedural or kind of formal way uh, i don't think it will have embedded so much if if it's more actually based on emotions and you know something that is more personal i think that that will be uh quite interesting to see how they have developed it in their own mind actually yeah. just you picked up there about the parents attending the yeah. graduation ceremonies in the pilot schools can you tell me a little bit about the reception of the course and maybe the the process of convincing schools to kind of let yes. you in uh, yes. and do, do 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 this kind of work yeah um, it's been very hard. <laughs> um, I think the, for two reasons. The first obstacle I found, well, first of all, schools like universities are very busy. So they have a packed schedule. The last thing they want is some, you know, innovative program uh, coming in and disrupting their curriculum. So, uh, so I totally understand that. I, I think for a lot, they had a genuine concern that it would be way beyond the children. How can you explain the European Union to kids who are five, six, seven, eight years old? That cannot work. Um, and you're a lecturer, 
but you're not a primary school teacher. You know, you're, you're going to, you're completely disconnected from what we do in a primary school. Very genuine concerns, quite honestly. Um, obviously, this program has been developed by myself as a lecturer, but it gains its credibility, its credibi credibility, sorry, from the fact that it was co-developed co-devel with a primary school teacher. So I have the knowledge on the European Union, if you want, but Trish Collier from Kilmurray National School has the wealth of knowledge on um, the, the primary school system, the pedagogy, the, the exercises that work and don't work and etc. And we really work together. And as I was saying earlier, um, I am delighted to say that she never asked me to dumb it down. So, you know, I went in and were words like shared sovereignty or solidarity or you know, there recently I, I gave a, a, a little talk on Brexit, proroguing the parliament. I used the words proroguing the parliament um, just to sow that seed. And some will remember, some won't. They'll get the meaning of it because then I explain it's suspending the parliament and it's not rocket science, you know. But I never dumbed it down. Um, and I worked with Trish and that has really, I think... Um, really uh, benefited the program. Um, so the, the teachers and the principals have been very reluctant thinking the kids are too young. They haven't been reluctant at all on the issue, which I was very pleased about, of you're coming to sell the European Union. Now, it was very clear that I wasn't, but yeah. they could have not believed me. <laughs> um, so, but they never even voiced a, a concern or a doubt or etc. It wasn't that, it was more how are you going to engage the kids for an hour on the European Union and Ireland? How is that going to work? Um, and I think through, as I said, the pedagogy and the fact that um, I brought it, I didn't dumb it down, but I simplified the jargon hugely. Um, and, and I also related it to their level. So, for example, the EU is a club. Are you part of a club? So you always have kids in a dancing club, football club, hurling club, whatever. So can you go in and kick the coach in the shins? No. Well, it's the same in the European Union. You have a certain number of rules. And if you want to do something different, then you have to get out of the club. There is flexibility, you know, and, and you start discussing this. And once you bring it to their level um, and relate to their, and I'm not saying it in a con condescending way, I'm just saying, relating it to their life and what they know, um, they're very well able to understand those concepts that might uh, appear as quite abstract. What I was hoping for as well was a bottom-up process whereby I hugely encourage them to, um, to get this knowledge and this awareness and this, those discussions that we had had in class and bring them back home. Because I kept telling them, your parents don't know anything about what you're doing in class here. Um, and in a way, you know, it works because they're very proud to know more than their parents. Um, and a lot of parents came to graduation also saying that to me, that it sparked for them an interest in those issues because the kids, obviously, we all know when your kids come back home and they start talking about something, yeah. you'd better brush up. <laughs> so so that that was also an interesting process of being rather bottom up now th this is very embryonic and probably quite yeah. anecdotal um but this is something that i'd like to to push or see develop yeah yeah and i suppose just on that that element of reception so the two parts one is did you look at any variation across the schools and did you get slightly different experiences from say yeah. rural urban schools or or the other schools in different areas of um, levels of wealth and so on. Yeah. And maybe a more speculative question about how do you think this type of programme might um, succeed or face challenges in a country that's perhaps a little bit more Eurosceptic than, than Ireland is more generally? Yes. So on the first question, um, I so because it was difficult to convince uh, teachers and uh, principals, um, I it was quite opportunistic. So the people who wanted to do it and um, I, I was jumping on the opportunity. Now I did go um, actually in terms of just those two parameters of uh, socioeconomic background and uh, location, uh, you know, rural versus urban, um, I, I got a good mix 
Um, and I can tell you it makes zero difference. <laughs> um, I was amazed, like I went to a very underprivileged school on the north side of Cork. Um, I did two first classes and one a split level class, fifth, sixth. Now the fifth, sixth were a bit more difficult simply because they were at that age. Yeah. Uh, so it was a bit, and it was a very large class, a bit more difficult. The first classes were absolutely amazing um I m made no difference with the first classes i had in more um in a more wealthy school i was going to as well um as i say i think why there was no difference or maybe a reason is because the kids came as blank slates it's not discussed at home the parents have no understanding no interest quite honestly so there's no kind of predefined uh, idea or conception when they come into class it's literally the, the one topic that came that was a bit more animated probably was at, right from the start was brexit yeah. because brexit everybody seems yeah. to have a bit of an opinion <laughs> um, but on the rest you know uh no no not so the single market the customs union you know pff, parents don't really know um so um so yes yeah, so that's um e even in terms of the club you know i i do that with the very young kids um what is uh, the decision making process in a club with 28 how difficult is that um and th like the kids had to develop their own ideas and the and ask me lots of questions but it the parents have got nothing to contribute. So they're blank yeah. slates, so it's great from that uh, point of view. Um, in terms, so no difference in terms of the different schools, the, the background of the kids, um, you know, it's, it's all down to interest. The one thing that made a difference uh, and was the gatekeeper was the teacher. If the teacher had a good interest in the course, I could see this, I could feel the support and the kids completely bought into it. Um, if the teacher was just taking me as the babysitter for the hour, uh, that didn't work mm -hmm. so much. <laughs> but it happened very rarely, so that was really, yeah. really good. Um, in terms of um, the, the future, yes, this is something I'd like to do. To go to other countries um, like Eastern European countries um, or countries, well a couple of countries um to see also what their experience is because ireland has been in the eu since 1973 so even though the kids have zero knowledge and the parents have zero interest nonetheless it's ingrained that the eu pays for things that i think everybody um has, has that notion in ireland um in you know in poland Hungary, the Czech Republic, Slovakia. Um, I would avoid a small country like Slovenia that is very pro-EU. Um, that would be probably easier to do, but maybe pick uh, one of those countries. But it'd be interesting to do it in France as well, because France, I think, has become more, I wouldn't say you're sceptic, but more critical of the yeah. EU um, and see how, how that goes. Or a country like Denmark, where the euro hasn't been accepted, where identity is a big, big uh, issue and where, you know, um, having the European flag next to the Danish flag seems to sometimes create a bit of, uh, uh, of tension. Um, so yes, th this is something that I, I would like to develop. At the moment, I'm trying to um, kind of um, embed this program within Ireland. I would love for it to spread to, you know, it, it was piloted in County Cork. I'd love for it to spread to uh, the whole of the country. So, um, so that's something that I'm negotiating at the moment and I'll see how it goes. And then the aim before I move to another country is to build a continuity of education between the primary, secondary and you know, college then. So it's the aim is to move into secondary uh, education um, where the curriculum is even more packed than in the uh, primary, but like first, second year and then fourth year transition year, you know, you could do something and build some kind of continuum because fundamentally, as we know, it's not about um, becoming a politics student. It's about developing your own citizenship and awareness of your citizenship that it you activate at different levels. So um, so that's that's the aim first. 
and then uh, see how this programme is received in other countries. Yeah. And just as a, I suppose a final question then, what kind of lessons have you learned for, from this process they might use to, to recommend other kind of education programmes across, across Europe? Um, I've learned, first of all, that the children are not too young, um, but you have to be very clear that you're not a lecturer going into a primary school. You have to to think, I'm a, I'm, I need to engage those kids. So you're not translating your lecture from, you know, first year or second year in college for a crowd of uh, seven or eight year olds. Um, you have to think things through in terms of how you're going to engage them and get them interested. Um, it works extremely well and they're very, very open to it. I think they're, it's the perfect age actually before they become teenagers. It's just the perfect age for because they're very open onto the world at the moment. They have access to the internet on Unfortunately, and we know it's very criticised, but a lot of them have access from a very young age to YouTube and etc. Um, so it, it's it's something. I, I the age I think um, this we should move away from this idea that they're too young. Uh, they're very well able if you give them the right tools, the safe space, and time just to express their ideas because obviously they're a little bit less articulate than our own students sometimes are better but and um and and just give them time but but they're they're very good um i would say um a similar a similar program could be implemented in all countries but again start local you know bottom up again so it has to be rooted in the country's history in the country's geography um you know in Ireland with its counties, I've used this to get the children to think about identity. Um, and, and obviously this wouldn't work necessarily in France because the regions aren't a huge thing in France, etc. So um, you need to adapt it to the national context. This idea that we're in a, well, I think that this idea that we're in a post-national citizenship space where you have you know one european european identity that is going to subsume all national identities uh, i don't think works and certainly the children wouldn't be receptive to that mm. they're well able to understand the layers the levels but not um, no, that, that yeah. wouldn't work so this is something else that i i, I would do um and in and i wouldn't shy away from the difficult uh discussions on sovereignty, on migration. We do a migration uh, crisis, European, uh, European Council Summit on the migration crisis in fifth and sixth class. It's been amazing. Like the children are just absolutely fantastic and they embrace the topic and, you know, they each represent a country. So obviously, you know, you have the Czech Republic or Hungary kind of firm against uh, the um, reallocation quota of uh, migrants uh, and you have Malta or Italy begging the EU to um, be more supportive and demonstrate solidarity. Um, but this is something they love acting out and, um, and it, it really speaks to them. So I wouldn't shy away from any difficult discussion um, you know, um, freedom of movement of people. Uh, I have many questions, but what about terrorism? Terrorists coming into our country and are we being threatened and etc. And, you know, then you, you need to tease out, well, a lot of the terrorists that, you know, perpetrated their arts in France were French. So there, there's, there, you need to kind of look at, um, at the details rather than just think freedom of movement of people or the bad guys are going to come in. Um, so not shy away from the difficult concepts, the di difficult discussions, and that is where this idea of pluralism um, is very important, I think, and let them express. I had a kid who said to me, why do I have to participate in the European election? My vote counts for nothing. He was eight. I was like, how? This is maybe something he heard at home, but mm. I had to respect that. I was like, and that maybe you're right. And I asked the others why they were voting. So they explained why their what their motivation was. But I said, you'll have other ways of participating politically. How? You know, and then he yeah. thought of 
what he would do. Um, so I'm not trying to impose anything. And I think this is the way to go, not to sell the EU. The EU has got lots of problems. The EU needs to be reformed. I think the EU needs to be politicized. I think we need to move away from technocracy and, and get citizens to enter a political debate on where the EU should go in terms of social justice, in terms of you know, uh, competition, deregulation, etc. This is absent. And I think this is largely why citizens regard it as um, you know, a cash cow and um, nothing much more. What does it mean for them? Not, not much more. But they, we have an opportunity with children, I think, to make them more, more aware, interested and, um, and understand the system better and therefore participate in it better. Excellent. On that um, rousing, <laughs> motivating speech for European <laughs> citizens, I say th thank you very much. Thank you. And we'll bring this to a close. Thanks.